Hi, my name is Jacinta Murphy and I'm a tutor at the, on the Early Years team here at Portobello Institute for a number of years. I'm delighted to welcome you to another in our expert-led webinar series. Tonight, we welcome the renowned Dr. Mary O'Kane. Mary's expertise, uh, areas of expertise are psychology and early childhood education. She is a lecturer with the Open University and regularly shares her knowledge on parenting, child well-being, education, play and creativity through public talks such as this, and she can be heard regularly on local and national radio and is a regular contributor on Ireland AM. Her recent publication, Perfectly Imperfect Parenting, Connection, Not Perfection, is available on Amazon. Well worth the read for all of us parents. And it is good to note that Mary also provides one-to-one -one parenting support. More information is available on her webpage. Mary will speak to us tonight about collaborative partnership with children and families. This will be followed by a presentation by Natasha Murphy, manager of the Portobello Montessori School and a member of the tutoring team here at Portobello also. She is a past pupil of Portobello Institute and currently a student on the master's program. Natasha will be talking about collaborative partnerships with parents and families also, but with a focus on STEAM. This will be followed by a short question and answer session. So if you have any topic related queries for Mary and or Natasha, please feel free to pop them in the comment box at the side of your screen. I'm very excited about the presentations this evening as cultivating collaborative, reciprocal, trusting relationships with parents is key to quality practice. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Dr. Mary O'Kane. Thank you very much, Jacinta. Well, that was a bit of an introduction there, wasn't it? Do you know, I was nervous. I was following Noreen Hayes is a very difficult thing to do. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm following Noreen. And now I have to follow that introduction, but thank you very much. Let's have a look here now. And if we'll see if Karan can get my slides up for me. There we go. Thank you very much. Guys, I am delighted. Um, to be able to be come here this evening and take part in this um, presentation about partnership and about collaboration. Um, it is an absolute pleasure um, to speak to you tonight. And funny, I lecture, as Jacinta said, I lecture in psychology, I lecture in early ed, I lecture in a master's module about partnership with families and whatever, and it's a really broad topic. And I was sitting thinking, preparing for this, oh my gosh, what am I going to cover? I'm going to have about like 24 hours of stuff. I thought, can I get it into half an hour? And I thought, okay, let's see, what am I going to cover? And I thought, instead of making it something very broad, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to narrow it down to one little part of partnership. In fact, something that I think is really impacting on parents at the moment and how as educators, we can support parents. I have this little word cloud here with all this practical stuff on it. And I put that up to tell you, I'm actually not going to cover all the practical stuff. Instead, I want to look at more the why. I want to look at sort of some of the theory, if you like. Natasha is going to follow me and I'm delighted that she's covering a lot of the practical stuff. That is great. But I really want to focus on this one issue that I think is really impacting on parents at the moment and to look at how we can support them. So to start, I should say, I'm coming at this from an ecological lens. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, guys, you know, um, I come at everything from an ecological lens. I do. Uh, and I always think, you know, when you think of Bronze Renner and you think of the Russian dolls and you think of all these little dolls neatly fitting inside each other. And there's a child inside all these layers. And it's all really easy and clean cut. When I was a little girl, my Nana had a set of Russian dolls and somebody had brought them to her from their travels. And back in the day, that was quite a while ago, they were unusual, really unusual to have in Ireland. And I remember playing with them as a kid and they all really neatly and perfectly slot into each other and you could, you could move them so everything was perfect. This year on Halloween, I was cutting pumpkins with my kids. And you know when you scoop everything out of the inside of the pumpkin? And I was thinking about it the following day, and I was thinking, we should have pumpkins instead of Russian dolls. You know the way the inside of a pumpkin is sinewy, it's messy, it's, um, it's certainly not clean cut and simple. And for me, I actually thought, my gosh, that is 
a, nearly a better representation of that ecological system. Because if we think of that child, those connections, they're, they're messy, they're sinewy, they're, they're not perfect, they're not clear cut, they're, they're challenging sometimes. And when I was making this little word cloud and I was thinking of all the practical stuff in terms of partnership and collaboration, and the word I kept coming back to was connection. Connection for me is at the heart of these partnerships. As, as Jacinta said, I just wrote my, my first book. I call it my first book as if there's another one on the way, but there might be. But anyway, I wrote my first book in 2021 and it was about April I published it. And as Jacinta said, Perfectly Imperfect Parenting, it's actually a book all about children's social and emotional development aimed really at parents. Although a lot of educators, a lot of my students are saying they've read it, but it's Perfectly Imperfect Parenting, Connection, Not Perfection. And I'm always telling parents that connection is at the heart of good parenting. Oh my gosh, guys, connection is at the heart of our relationships, our relationships with the children, with their parents, with their families, with their extended families, their grannies, the, the stepdads, everybody in this messy system, it is our connection. So what I want to look at tonight, the, the issue I want to zone in on is the pressure that society puts on parents to be perfect. There's pressure that is put on parents to be this absolutely perfect parent, the impact that has on their parenting, because in my view, it has a huge impact and how as educators, we can really support parents within that messy lens to, if you like, maybe to remove themselves and some of the guilt and, and some of the imperfection that they feel. Okay, and I start with this. I love this saying, the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Guys, every time we hear that saying, we kind of think about parents, don't we? My argument is, oh my gosh, that is equally as relevant for you. Because if, if I'm a stay-at-home parent and I'm with my child all the time and my child doesn't go to crash, they don't go to preschool, they're with me, my baby or whatever, absolutely yes. But once I take that absolute leap of faith to trust this educator with my baby, and it doesn't matter how old my baby is, it doesn't matter if it's a preschooler coming into whatever age, it's the same at primary school, the same at secondary school, you know. If, if I take that leap of trust to trust that educator with my baby, they are the hand that rocks the cradle. And I know it as a parent. I'm really aware that I'm giving permission to you to influence my baby to be there to, for this little you know, bundle of, of importance to me that you are going to make your stamp on that child. And that's that's a huge issue of trust. So I sort of wanted to start with that. I actually put this little note up here to remind myself, I must say something to you. I said I lecture about um, parents and families and partnerships, and I'm always talking about the strengths parents bring to the relationship. And it's so important that we are aware of those strengths. I'm actually not going to focus on their strengths tonight. I'm, I'm going to focus on this challenge that they're facing. But I just felt it was really important to say that it's not that I don't see their strengths. It's really, really not. But I really want to talk about this challenge that parents are facing. So, so if you like, I'm just stating that from the outset that that's where I'm coming from, the challenge that they're facing. Okay, I want to read this out to you guys. I love this quote from this lady. Her name is Bunmi Ladatan. Let me just read this to you, okay? How to be a mom in 2017. Equally, equally as valid today in 2022. Make sure your children's academic, emotional, psychological, mental, spiritual, physical, nutritional, and social needs are met. While being careful not to overstimulate, understimulate, and properly medicate, helicopter, or neglect them in a screen free, processed food free, GMO free, negative energy free, plastic free, body positive, socially conscious, egalitarian, but also authoritative, nurturing, but fostering of independence, gentle, but not overly permissive, pesticide free, two story, multilingual home, preferably in a cul de sac with a backyard, 1.5 siblings spaced at least two years apart for proper development, and don't forget the coconut oil. Guys, that is the life of mothers today, or moms, as Bun Me calls them. Now, my book is directed at parents, so it's directed at moms and dads, but can I be really honest with you? I feel a lot of the pressure that Bun Me is talking about here is aimed at mothers. 
She says, how to be a mom in literally every generation before ours. Feed them sometimes. Guys, it wasn't always like this. It definitely wasn't. This, for me, sums up the pressure that parents are being put under today. I recently, just before Christmas, I was writing a chapter for a new book, um, that it, somebody else's book, that's actually, it's called Unraveling. It's, oh, it's the most beautiful book. This girl, her name is Geraldine Walsh. She writes for the Irish Times on parenting. And she's writing this book called Unraveling about motherhood. Pulling the threads of motherhood. Beautiful, beautiful book. And I'm involved in one of the chapters with her. And I was talking about the word parenting. The word parenting, we use it now as goal-directed verb, your parenting. There was no such word as parenting. There was no such thing in my mom's generation or her mom's generation. It didn't exist. But we have filtered down that parenting now has become one of the most high stakes jobs of our lives. And we are put under pressure by society to be perfect. Donald Winnicott, and I'm going to talk about him in the moment, and I love Donald Winnicott and his idea of good enough parenting, or good enough mothering, as he originally said, but good enough parenting now. To most of us today, good enough? No, I don't want to be good enough. I don't want to be a good enough parent. I need to be a perfect parent. Why do I need that? I think particularly in the world of social media. Oh my gosh, Instagram. Guys, I avoid Instagram when I possibly can because I go online. If you look at parenting on Instagram, you will come away feeling a failure. You'll come away feeling so inadequate because it's just all perfection, absolutely perfection. And people who fall below this bar, the standard that we've set, oh my gosh, oh, they're criticized, particularly on social media. So this idea of per perfectionism, I have to be this perfect parent, what does it lead to? It leads to anxiety. It leads to the belief oh my gosh, I have to be the perfect parent. If I can become the perfect parent, then I will have the perfect child. Really dangerous, guys. First of all, it's unattainable. We, we're human. We are all human. Nobody can be the perfect parent. I'm sure you've heard that saying, um, oh, we've all, you know, we all talk about the perfect parent, but it's like a unicorn. You know, we've all heard about a unicorn, but have you ever actually seen one? You know, do they really exist? There is no such thing as a perfect parent. But we're struggling. We're struggling to try and reach this unattainable goal, which means we're setting ourselves up for failure. Even worse, because we believe if I can be perfect, the perfect parent, I'm going to have this perfect offspring, we're setting our children up for failure too. Instead, what should we aim for? Winnicott's good enough. This good enough that parents absolutely struggle with. Why? Because being good enough is being human. It's just being human. We want to be caring. We want to be empathetic. But we, we cannot be this perfect parent. And my whole argument is, if parents need to let go of perfection, let go of it, instead, focus on connection. Connection is what they absolutely need. So how does this tie into you? This, this messy relationship that we have with our parents, as educators we have with parents, is so important in terms of helping parents understand this pressure they've been put under, helping them understand that this is something society is doing to them, but instead they can breathe. You know, funny, often when I'm talking about the relationships between educators and parents, we talk about power imbalances. And I think, you know, I, I would get it a lot maybe at third level lecturing and um, at secondary school, you know, the power imbalances at primary school. Very often in terms of early years education, we think, oh, but there isn't really a power. Is there really a power imbalance? You know something, guys? I think you are in a position where, and now, as I said at the beginning, you know, please don't think that I, I, I do not understand the strengths that parents bring to that relationship. I absolutely do. But for this issue, your understanding of child development, your understanding of attachment theory, your understanding about Winnicott, about good enough mothering, your understanding of all these theories in education, 
mean that you are in a more powerful position where you can share your knowledge with the parent to help them, to help them just breathe and take that moment and think, you know what, I am good enough and good enough is what my child needs which leads me to Winnicott. Oh my gosh. You got, and in fact, I probably should have put up a slide about Bulby and uh, attachment theory even before this, because so many parents wouldn't necessarily have heard of attachment theory. Probably parents, you know, some of them would have, but even still, so many parents are not aware. But I'm an absolute believer in attachments, but I love the work of Winnicott. So moving on from attachments, his whole argument, yes, when those babies are born. What do we do? We are highly attuned to every need. We like to think, or so we try, we try our best. Again, pressure to be perfect. We put pressure on ourselves to do it, but we're so tuned into the, their needs and absolutely rightly so. But this argument, which I really don't think parents um, have heard about or really fully understand, that as we try our best to be perfect, we try to meet every need, and this is wonderful, and our babies are, are becoming securely attached. You know, we, they're using us as a secure base. They're seeing that they're worthy. They're seeing that we will meet their needs. They're seeing that when they make their needs known, we might not always get it right. Yeah, you know, we definitely don't, but we're trying our best, and that's what's important. But sometimes we can't meet those needs. We can't always be that perfect parent. Not humanly possible. Absolutely not possible all those little failures, those minor failures, we cannot meet those needs. They make a difference to that child in terms of resilience, in terms of their self-belief. You know what? I, I cried. You know, I'll give you an example. You know, Alan, this has happened to me. They're in the back of the car in the car seat and you're driving along and maybe the soother pops out and they drop something. You can't just pull in on the motorway, you know, and they cry at you, they scream at you, you, where are you? You are supposed to meet my every need here and you can't. And they calm down and you talk to them and you help them self-regulate and you help them through that experience. And they learn, oh, she's actually not perfect. She doesn't always get it right, but I can survive. I can survive that. It wasn't the end of the world. I can thrive in an imperfect world such a good lesson. So if, if parents realize the work of Winnicott, they realize they do not have to be perfect, it helps them step back. When I'm finding an awful lot, and I'll actually, can I hold my hand up here and say, um, this is me I'm talking about here. I was that parent who, who put myself under this pressure to be perfect all the time, felt I had to be this perfect parent, felt I had to get everything right. This was the most important job I had ever been trusted with. And it was really, really important that I was successful at this job. And what happened? I became controlling. You know, and I hate these terms, but you know, we talk about helicopter parenting and lawnmower parenting. If you haven't heard of them, guys, the idea of helicopter parenting is you're hovering around above, you know, you're circulating over them, watching lawnmowers where we're mowing a path in front of them, you're clearing the way. And believe me, guys, I was a helicopter and a lawnmower. I was a lawnmower with like a helicopter rotor above my head. That was me. That was the way I parented when my kids were little. But what role do we have as educators? Letting parents know they, they don't need to, they can breathe. We are so used to the idea in education of scaffolding. I, I give an awful lot of talks to parents now. Parents, the vast majority of parents I come in, in connection with, or I come in touch with, they, they have never heard the word scaffolding, their child's learning. I always say to them, think of yourself as the clue to the crossword. But as educators, to let them know that, that they don't need to be the helicopter. They don't need to be that lawnmower, that they can scaffold that child's learning. They can step back. We think of Vygotsky, that the child being ahead of themselves, to step back and let their child be that little bit more independent. I'm the clue to the crossword. I help you. I give you that little bit of support when you need it but I step back when you don't need me. It's such an important lesson for parents, a lesson that you're putting into practice in your setting every day of the week without even thinking about it probably most of the time. You're probably doing it on an autopilot without even really thinking about what you're doing because you've become so attuned to that way of thinking 
but to maybe speak to parents about this and to let them know this information that we are so used to as educators is information that can make such a difference to this pressure that, that parents are feeling under. So say our parents are feeling this pressure, they're feeling the need to helicopter, the need to lawnmower, the need to um, be there ahead of their child. What impact is that having on children? Guys, I want to share a little bit of research with you. This, um, this is the front cover and the picture here of a book by the lady, a lady called Jean Twenge. And I'm just looking at my time and I'm thinking, you need to speed up, Mary. Jean Twenge is a professor in the University of San Diego. And in San Diego, they got access to five decades of research from American schools. So they didn't actually um, undertake, collect the data. The data was uh, data that was collected in the schools anyway. So it was, um, they looked to test their children in schools in America. And um, so this was five decades of data. And Jean Twenge got this data and she was looking at levels of anxiety and depression in children over this five decades because she predicted that and you should see her graphs. You, I have references at the end, guys, if you want to look, but you can, as well as her book, there's lots of information online. Her graphs are going like this. You know, over the five decades, levels of anxiety and depression are absolutely going up. But I just want to tell you about two little things that she found. She has a wealth of data, actually really interesting, guys, well worth the read. Um, but just two tiny little things. The first one is locus of control. Just in case you're not familiar with locus of, of control, we talk about this a lot in psychology. Locus of control, and I'm, I'm sure you would have done it in your training, but it's either internal or external. And locus of control basically means, do I believe I can control my world? Um, do I believe I'm, I'm an agent for change? If something goes wrong, can I make change? Can I, do I have control over what's happening in my life? So internal means, yep, I believe I have control. External means I have to seek support from elsewhere. I don't actually believe I can control my own world, my own destiny. And um, when something goes wrong, um, can I be that agent for change? It had completely shifted, guys. This is really frightening. The average teen in 2002 felt less control over their destiny than 80% of the teenagers in the 1960s. So in the 1960s, when something went wrong, when, when something happened in the world, they believe, yeah, I can work it out. I can figure it out. I'll just give you a quick example. So in, in these tests, they would have asked them things like, if such and such happened, what would you do? And they would have had to ask her, oh, well, I think I might do this. Or I'd have to ask a friend. Or oh, I'd go to my mom. Or I'd ask my dad. Or mm, maybe my teacher could help. So internal is, I would know what to do. So huge shift in that. Second thing that she found another shift in was intrinsic and extrinsic goals. So intrinsic, same kind of thing. Intrinsic, within me, intrinsic goals. I'm doing something that's motivated by personal development. It's motivated by, ah, we think about Portobello, studying. Studying is a very intrinsic goal because most people who are studying their early ed degree are doing it for themselves. They know um, that they're good at what they do and they want to have that degree. They want to have that piece of paper to show their knowledge. And um, extrinsic is I'm doing something purely for material gain, for status. I always think about like the Kardashian effect. It's extrinsic, it's money, it's fame, it's whatever. Validation from others is extrinsic and um, same thing the kids have shifted from intrinsic to extrinsic so what she's telling us is our teenagers today are very um, external in their looks of control they don't believe they can control the world but also they're really reliant on external sources of validation by the way she did find as well anxiety and depression up 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 so that's american Th does that happen in ireland Yes. Now, not her. The, the goals, that's a separate piece of research. But I just wanted to say that in Ireland, we have exactly the same findings in terms of anxiety and depression. Our levels of anxiety and depression. So, so her data is relevant to the Irish context because we're finding the same here. Mental health issues and th these findings. This this um, Mary Cannon study. Mary Cannon is the Royal College of Surgeons. This was a large, large study. By the age of 13, one in three children will have experienced mental health difficulty. By the age of 24, one in two. This research is frightening, guys. So just to say this is relevant to the Irish context. Okay, so Jean Twenge blamed this on social media, okay? However, if I bring this back to parenting, okay? Levels of anxiety are increasing. Levels of depression are increasing. I don't believe I can control my world. I'm very reliant on others. 
it's nearly a lack of trust in themselves. So she has she has a point now. This her data is factual data. Her theory is so you know she can't actually prove causality here, but her theory is this is linked to social media. You may have heard of Professor Peter Gray. Professor Peter Gray was Boston University. I actually think he's retired now. This is the front cover of his book. Peter Gray saying, hold on a minute, let's go back to when they're younger. Play. Could there be changes in the way our children play before they ever get near social media that is changing our teenagers as they're growing up? They have all these issues. Bring it back. Bring it right back down to when they are little. If you have a quick read of this quote, if you think about what he's saying, in culture today, parents and other adults overprotect our children. We underestimate their ability and that becomes a self-fulfilling pro prophecy. Think about what I said about the need for perfection. If I feel I have to be perfect, if I feel I have to be on top of everything, if I'm helicoptering, if I'm lawnmower, if I'm controlling my children, am I giving them the opportunity for free play? Guys, I mean, I'm talking to the converted here. You know this, you know the importance of play. Do our parents really understand this? I'll just read this quick quote. Play in all its rich variety is one of the highest achievements of the human species alongside language, culture, and technology. Indeed, without play, none of those other achievements would be possible. The value of play is being increasingly recognized with it by researchers within the policy arena. However, is this really true of parents? And even if they understand the value of play, the value of play in your setting, is that that understanding really in conflict with this societal pressure? So the pressure I'm feeling to be perfect, to be to control, to be on top of what's happening, that's actually really in conflict with the belief that I should be standing back. I should be really aware of the value of free play. Do they understand it? I would argue very often not. And again, I feel the role of the educator, not only you know, we're, we're letting parents know about um, Winnicott, we're letting them know about good enough parenting, we're letting them know that they do not have to be that perfect parent, we're letting them know that their minor failures are actually building resilience, but also to, to talk to them about play. Um, I, again, I love this quote. In many ways, children's right and opportunities for play are constrained within modern urbanized societies within Europe. It seems to be a consequence of environmental stresses of contemporary life. That's that pressure. Risk of our society, separation from nature, and tensions with the educational area, with this emphasis on earlier, is better. Think back to the helicoptering and the lawn mowing. I honestly think this pressure that they are under means that even if inherently they believe in the value of free play, they really struggle to support it. And the role of educators here, it, it honestly cannot be underestimated. Again, think to that power imbalance. I know I'm really not underestimating the strengths parents bring to the relationship, but the trust they have in you, you are in a position where they have trusted this little soul to you. They, they, that in itself is such a leap of faith, but they know that you have an understanding of this theory of child development, of the importance of these factors. So working with them to really help them become more comfortable with these concepts is so important. I put up these pictures, I love these pictures. How did we survive? When I was a kid, guys, I'm, oh my gosh, I'm really aware. I'm going to fly through the last few slides really, really quickly here. But I have to tell you this story really quickly. I remember when I was a kid and I was of the generation, get out there on the road and play. Come back when you're hungry. We had a caravan in Arco and all my cousins would be down there all summer. And it was literally thrown out the door in UK. We, the caravan park was our world. We could do what we wanted. Off we went. And I look at these pictures. How did we survive? I mean, I don't know. We had scraped knees. And well, no, we'd broken arms with whatever, whatever. But can I just say something? I think in Ireland, my mum's generation, like my parents and their parents' generations, my grandparents, had absolute trust. They had absolute faith in society, faith in the world. They let their children out to play, believing that their children were safe and they were proved wrong. And my generation then became the most fearful 
generation of parents we became the, I, I always talk about the play date parents oh my gosh I mean I'm not being insulting miss play date oh my gosh I'm, I remember with my eldest play date with every kid in the class the play date generation of parents that were it's come to my home come to my garden we don't let them loose we hear the kids are in the garden it's a summer day and the kids are playing in the garden and you're having the cup of coffee and you hear a scream and we all jump up and we go running we go running out to investigate what's going on would you like to tell her how you feel we intervene and i think that change has been damaging for our children and it comes back. Think about locus of control. Think about intrinsic and extrinsic goals. In order to develop these skill sets, we need the resilience that free play brings out. We need parents who will step back, who will actually scaffold their children, who will take that moment to let their children go out there and get up and fall down. When I was in a kid in that caravan park in Arklow, what did we learn? We learned conflict resolution. We learned to negotiate. We learned when to stand up for ourselves. We learned when to back down. We learned to protect little ones younger than us. We learned all these skill sets because there wasn't an adult constantly, constantly hovering. You know that in your setting, but do your parents actually really understand that? And even if they know that, even if in the back of their minds, that knowledge is there, is this pressure that society putting on them to be this perfect parent, to be in control of everything, to be on top of everything? Is that fighting with this, you know, wanting to give their children that little bit of freedom, but yet this pressure is being put on them to, to constantly control, to be in control? Do you know, and I think risk has an awful lot to do with it, guys. It's as if we think if we control everything, I can outrun risk. My child will be safe and this generation of parents absolutely um are safety in health and safety so and i'm sorry i'm really wearing I'm, I'm running so much over time here okay so again back to you oh my gosh this little goldfish is not you or maybe it is you maybe we need to be brave too because it's not easy sometimes to approach these topics with parents. You know, do you have a webinar coming up, a parent webinar? Do you have a newsletter you can write about it? You know, to think about how can I share my knowledge with my parents? And sometimes that does take a bit of bravery. Um, so maybe the, the goldfish with the shark fin is you sometimes. But it, I think it is a lot of your parents. Be, you know, I know I've been that woman. You are this goldfish and you need to put that little shark fin in your back because the parents need to know that it's so important that they step back a little bit, that their children need to take healthy risks, make choices, solve problems, you know, stick with what they start. If their children are going to build confidence, if their children are going to develop these skills, the resilience that will equip them to face that world without believe they can control their destiny, believe that they know themselves, they don't need to be constantly looking for validation from others, to have that little bit of resilience. And this should really help with those findings, both in Ireland and America, the findings of anxiety and depression. Because as Peter Gray says, and I absolutely believe the man is right, Gene Twenge is talking about social media and that's fine, but it's earlier. This is starting when they're little and, and their time in with you is wonderful, giving them that experience of free play. But it's so important that parents understand that they need to step back that little bit. You know, and the clue to the crossword, I'm scaffolding that, that um, my child's learning. I'm not constantly jumping it up and doing it. Oh my gosh, sorry. Okay, I'm going to really fly here because I've slightly gone over. Okay, I won't go through all these slides, but one last thing, and it's just judgment. Because of that power relationship, it's just so important that we are aware of it, that, that they don't see us, that they don't see you as another form of judgment. So, how we actually negotiate these conversations is so important. If we want to create, create really respectful alliances, we have to recognize they don't always get it right. You know, parents are human, they are human. And sometimes they need to know we are too. So again, in terms of that power dynamic, stepping back a little, a little recognizing they're all individuals, meeting each family where they are, and um, looking at 
our practice from the perspective of each individual child, each individual family, recognizing that these little Russian dolls are like the inside of that pumpkin. They're messy, they're sinewy. And we need to be aware of that and be respectful of that. And, and that's okay. We don't have to be this perfect Russian doll. Connection, not perfection. Just as I'm saying to parents with their children, focus on connection, not perfection. This is exactly it um, for you. I was going to tell you a story here, but I don't have time. I'm going to just read this quote because I love it. I closed off all easy roads leading to me, but I'm reachable if you're willing to go that extra mile. You know, any parent who's struggling, they are reachable. They're, and they're reachable through its connection. It's that sinewy mess. Okay, And don't forget, they appreciate I'm Quickly read this quote. Thank you for not judging us when we turn up at 7.30 and she's still in her PJs. It's hard work getting three children out the door for 7 a.m. And sometimes I don't quite tick all the boxes. There have been times I've dropped her off in last night's jammies and times I've had to carry her sleeping from her bed to the car to nursery to hand over to you. Thank you for accepting without judgment that sometimes I suck at the life work balancing. Guys, sometimes we can be that little bit judgmental and to, to, to breathe and to meet them where they are. Um, now, I guess I want to finish on this. So what do they need to know from you? And they need to know you believe this because if they don't believe you believe it, they will not believe it about themselves. But they need to know that you believe their child, who does each parent, for each parent, your child needs you. They need you, messy pumpkin inside of you with all your flaws and all your perfections. You who gets it wrong, and that's fine, but you come back to repair. You know that connection is what's really important. They need to know that the child needs them, the parent who loves them, all their flaws, all their imperfections, good enough parenting. That's the parent, the good enough parent, not the perfect parent. And if they believe you believe that, it will be so much easier for them to believe it. Last slide for Natasha. Is probably, You're eating into my time here. I just want to put this up. Who says teaching is stressful? I'm 39 and I feel great. This is how what I'm picturing you all looking like now. You're probably only 21 and that, that's exactly how I'm imagining you all sitting out there. But don't forget. You, you will never be able to maintain those relationships with parents without looking after yourself. I think, to be honest, guys, and I actually was tempted to do a session on COVID and I thought, no, focus on something else. But the last year and a half, two years have been so challenging for everybody, absolutely everybody. Think about Maslow. Think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know what? We, were, we should be aiming low down that pyramid. We should be aiming for love, for connection, for empathy with our parents, with our families, with our children, with all their extended families. And for you, because it, it, this has impacted on absolutely everybody and absolutely, I, and I just wanted to acknowledge that at the end. So, I'm, I'll finish on that note. Guys, I'm sorry, Natasha. I know I've gone over here. But look, guys, I hope you found it is helpful. I've put up my social media details here um, and my book. My book is also available on my website, www.drmaryokane.ie. Um, but if you're on social media, guys, I would love to connect with you. I hope it's given you food for thought about one tiny little issue, but an issue I think is just really important at the moment. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, Mary, thank you so much for that engaging, informative and thought provoking presentation. I mean, I just uh, I'd love to go deeper into it all with you. I, I'm a great believer with the child is born the guilt. And oh. there just has been so much pressure put on parents. It was already a pressurized job, shall we say. But in the last year and a half, people were trying to be perfect parents, perfect teachers, perfect this, perfect that, perfect. the other. Yeah. It, it was just unbelievable. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I do believe it is the educator's job to build, not knock. So I think in supporting and, and providing the information and the tools of being good enough is absolutely key. Thank you so much. But 
without uh, further ado, I better hand over to Natasha. And I personally am interested to hear about uh, First Lego League's discovery programme in the earlier setting. And Portobello Montessori School is the first earlier setting in Ireland to introduce this, as to date it has only been implemented at primary level. It embraces that collaborative approach to learning. And she will now tell us how. Over to Natasha. Hi everyone, how are you? Jacinta, thank you so much. And Dr. Mary O'Kane, all I can say is, wow, that was incredible. It was interesting. It was insightful. And I thoroughly enjoyed every single minute of it. Again, I, as Jacinta said, I would have listened all night. <laughs> so now um, it's time for my presentation. So I'm just going to get it up here. Ah, here it is. So today I'm going to talk, be talking about collaborative partnership with children and families and I'm going to be looking at it kind of broad at the start and then we're going to focus in and look at it through STEAM education. So I suppose actually before I start a little bit about me. <laughs> so my name is Tasha Murphy. I am a student on the master's programme here at Portobello Institute and I also manage Portobello Montessori School. We have a very diverse school and we cater for um, children with 13 nationalities. So very exciting. I, you can probably tell from my face, I absolutely adore my job. And I'm sure anyone logged in here feels the exact same. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited for, for tonight. And as Cynthia said, I will be talking about first, Le first Lego League. And we are the first preschool in Ireland to introduce this. So I'm really excited to tell you all more. <laughs> so partnership of parents. Partnership involves parents, families and practitioners working together to benefit children. Each recognises, respects and values what the other does and says. And that's really important that we do respect each other and take on board what each other is saying. So building a partnership with children and their families links to Bronfenbrenner's ecological model as the child's family is one of the first and most important relationship that they develop within the microsystem. The mesosystem then involves the practitioners and the school linking with families. This allows the child to strive for excellence and gain a positive mindset for future learning. It is very important to develop a family friendly culture, so school culture, that supports a partnership approach. As we all know, the COVID-19 global pandemic slightly changed the way we partner with parents and with children and with extended families. However, there are still numerous ways that we can nurture this collaborative partnership. And I think one thing about COVID-19, it did kind of, for me personally, it helped to get that two-way um, communication going a bit more like parents were telling me what they were doing every day you know I was sharing uh, you know little activities and I'll talk about that now so how can how at the moment do I partner with parents so we organize home visits prior to the child starting school and I think this is really good for the child settling in process and easing that transition but actually it gave me an opportunity to lay the foundation of building that strong, secure, trusting relationship before the child even started. We also involve parents in their child's learning by having open invitations for parents to come in and showcase a skill, discuss their career, or share their home language and culture with us. Uh, before COVID, we did have a lovely parent came in and they had only moved to Ireland um, about I'd say six months before and so he, they were originally Italian and he came in he was a chef and he made pizzas with the children and it was great he got to showcase the skill showcase the career and also introduce some um, Italian for the children to learn as well so again we got to embrace uh, their culture. We also invite parents and family members on outings prior to the pandemic. So our last school tour that we got to go on, we did bring 19 parents and three siblings who were actually past students of mine on our school tour. And it was really interesting for me. I had originally never thought of this idea and loads of parents started being like, oh my God, like I'm so excited for my child to go. Like we've never seen, you know, three families expressed that they had never actually seen a sheep in real life and to me that's mind-blowing I'm from the country and like if I look out the window I can see about 40 sheep uh, just chilling in the field um, so I kind of looked at 
my school tour and said, well, how can I accommodate parents to come along as well? So I put the opportunity out there. 19 parents grabbed onto it. Three siblings came as well. And at the end of the day, I actually think the parents enjoyed it more. <laughs> so throughout the pandemic, we partnered with parents by sending preschool packs where we sent like colors, coloring books, Play-Doh, um, a little creation bag with lollipop sticks, glitter, feathers, uh, pipe cleaners, you name it, we had it. And I suppose that was the first uh, introduction of STEAM that the parents got because they couldn't believe that, you know, their child creating something with all of these materials was linking to arts and a lot more. We also shared daily activities. And we made sure that the daily activities that we were sharing, that they were easy for parents to do at home. So like pairing and matching socks, you know, opening, closing the clothes pegs as you're hanging out the washing. Um, you know, and really easy kind of practical skills that it was no extra trouble for, for the parents. Doing weekly circle times. So for this, we actually uh, broadcast that to anybody who wanted to join. And we ended up connecting with more families than uh, actually families in my setting. And I still keep in touch with a family down in Kerry that I met through this as well. So you can partner with parents, even if they're not in your setting. Uh, we also did weekly circle um, story time, sorry. And then we did smaller group Zoom calls. And this really helped to keep the two-way communication open for children, parents and families as they got to sit in you know, um, interact with us on the Zoom call and also the circle time as well. Actually, it was the first time that a lot of parents got an insight into kind of what we do in school. And uh, a couple of them, as I was saying, we've 13 nationalities. So a couple of them were shocked, you know, at how great they were at speaking English and that. So it was a lovely insight into the classroom, I suppose, for them. Because uh, a lot of children, it was their first year with us and, you know, it was so unexpected uh, when clothes, etc. So it was really interesting for them. And it also brought a bit of normality to the child's week. So how can practitioners build a collaborative partnership with children and families? So really, really, really important is respect. Okay, two-way respect. We must respect parents. They are the child's primary educator. Okay, and we can learn so much from them. It's really important to learn from them. We need to listen and we need to actively listen and we need to attentively listen as well. You know, if parents need it, we need to be able to provide parents with resources to support their child's learning, whether that's a resource like a hands on resource or whether it's just tips and tricks. We should be available to do this. It's also really important that when we're listening and respecting parents that we do take on board the parents' ideas as well. I know they were great uh, during the pandemic, especially, you know, they were doing different ideas. They were sharing it with me. I was putting it up onto Instagram then to share it with everybody else. And it was, you know, it was lovely. And it gave a bit of a sense of community, like school community. And then really important, no matter what conversation you have with a parent, it's so important that we always leave the lines of communication open. So Bronf and Brenner believe that the parent, child and educator triangle, triangle builds the strongest structure and that home and school should be brought together. Children have a more meaningful and appropriate experience when there is a level of consistency between, between the home and the earlier service. Therefore, what the child learns in the setting needs to be supported at home. However, it's just as important that what the child learns at home needs to be supported in the setting. As I said earlier, the parents are the child's first educator. So now just a little bit of STEAM. So I want to give you a little bit about STEAM before I launch into our first um, Lego League, which I'm just so excited about. <laughs> so STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts and Mathematics. So STEAM isn't something that we engage in with a one-off activity. It is something that we can incorporate into our everyday lives. And this is something that I really wanted to hone in with parents because it's something that parents actually do all the time. You know, any conversation that you have with your child, it's a learning experience, okay? Any, you know, conversation where you say to the child, um, oh, we're making beans and I'm putting them in the microwave. 
well, talk about the microwave. How do the beans go into the microwave? How do they heat up? What is, you know, the technology behind that? So it can be as simple as that. And then you're using STEAM language. Therefore, working collaboratively with parents to promote and enhance the language of STEAM is very important and provides the child with similar learning opportunities in school and at home. So a positive working relationship between home and school makes the learning experience much more positive and successful. It is through our interaction with children and improving the quality of discussions we have with children and using those open-ended questions. And we all know children have lots of questions <laughs> that we can help to support their learning and development. Giving children time to answer and opportunities to ask as many questions will enhance the learning taking place within the setting. Also, for parents and practitioners, we do not know everything. So if a child asks you a question and you are not sure of the answer, don't worry. Involve the child in the research process. So going to the computer and Googling, you know, and researching. It. Involve them in that process and explain to them, you know, what you're doing. So using STEAM language in our everyday discussions and involving our children in as many experiences as we can within the home, you know, even when we're cooking or boiling an egg, questioning why is it soft to begin with and then hard and solid when it has been cooked, you know? So question all these things and see what the child knows already about it and then, you know, extend that learning. Parents can encourage the child's language and particularly the language of STEAM by creating opportunities and spaces for them to talk, keeping the conversation moving and pausing often to allow the child to think, process and respond. By incorporating this language into your everyday routine, parents are supporting and introducing concepts of STEAM to complement and support the learning taking place in the setting. And this collaborative pr process ensures the child, the children, sorry, are continually progressing and moving forward in their understanding of new and emerging concepts. So for example, a mealtime. Having lunch at home or having lunch, whether it's a rolling snack or whether it's lunchtime in an early year setting, you can use STEAM language to give the child an opportunity to explore, investigate, think critically and creatively. So linking to science, ask the child, how does food give us energy? How does food grow? For technology, talk about the things that you use to make and prepare the food. Did you use an oven or a microwave? What utensils are you using to eat the food? Engineering. Ask the child, how do we cook the food? For art, can you make your food into a picture or a pattern? For example, a face. Maths. Involve the child in making the lunch. Do we need to measure ingredients? Or ask how many slices of bread do we need? And go get them. Or what time will, be, will we be eating lunch at? It is important for practitioners and for parents to question, predict, explore, discuss and observe. So, very exciting. As I've said, we are going to be the first preschool to introduce First Lego League and we are so excited. So we have recently started to collaborate with the children and families in our setting through STEAM education. We have implemented First Lego League and we're currently doing the Discover programme, so that's for our age range. And it allows children to work in groups of four with the support of their teacher and explore a real world team with Lego. And the theme this year is transportation. So if you order something, you know, what is the whole process behind it? You know, they're putting it into a truck, they're delivering it to you, etc. So you're talking about all areas of transportation. Each year, First Lego League release a new challenge theme and begin the Discover program by setting a starting point, which we already do, asking the children what they already know. Then they design a new model of their own with Lego Duplo elements and explore and discover STEM and STEAM skills along the way. Then you actually finish with an in-school celebration to congratulate the children and celebrate all the amazing achievements that they have done. So it actually has 10 sessions. That's the 10 sessions overall. And the 10th session is the let's celebrate. So in each session, you have a warm up and then you have three tasks. 
So the first session is let's discover. The second session is let's deliver. The third session is let's transport. The fourth session is let's sort. The fifth is let's innovate. The sixth is let's explore jobs. The seventh is let's use ramps. The eighth is let's improve. And the ninth is let's con let's connect. And as I said, the 10th then is the celebration. So very exciting. So you're probably wondering, how do we involve parents and families in this? So first, Lego League provides six bricks, which is actually known as the Discover More set. So they provide six bricks of Lego for every child, which they can explore and play with throughout the day in the classroom, and then continue this learning, exploration and discovery at home with their families. So the warm up that I was talking about in every session is actually with the six bricks, and then for the task, they're using that Duplo Lego that you can see in the picture here. So again, their warm up is with the six bricks and then they bring that home. So parents are encouraged to be involved and support their child's learning and creativity in their home environment. So actually, First Lego League um, have a document that you send to parents and they do actually recommend to have a meeting with parents and explain the process, you know, give them all the tools, the resources to be able to um, implement this. But also, like Mary was saying, to reassure them that it's not an extra task. It does not have to be perfect, you know you're letting your child create and it's your questions that will allow them then to enhance their learning. Um, and this provides a crossover then between the learning at home and the learning at school. And then again, this is supporting the collaborative process and ensuring that parents and practitioners are fully involved and supported during the process. So what is Six Bricks? So Six Bricks is a hands-on tool for learning through fun and short activities, which are actually given, but you can also make your own. With sets of Duplo Lego, bricks in six bright colors, children can practice their memory, movement, creative, and much more. You can adapt activities and of course, make your own activities to match the children's skills and interests. And I think that's really important is this kind of shows because you can adapt it, it means it's suitable for any child who is going to do this. So what skills will children learn in the home and the early years? When children are engaged and challenged in playful ways, they use, develop and practice skills such as language. So they describe what they built in rich detail. They give and understand clear instructions. They tell stories about what they built and why they built it, which then helps them to communicate with others and express their ideas. Problem solving. They identify a challenge and have to overcome it. So if the Lego just won't fit, you know, and they want it there, how are they going to overcome this challenge? They have to learn to stay focused. They're setting goals and making a plan to achieve, you know, maybe building the train, coming up with creative ideas and reflecting on what they have done and how they did it. And that's from us asking, you know, oh, tell me about your creation. That's allowing them to reflect. Collaboration then, working together, they might do it in pairs, they might do it as a team, they're taking turns, they're sharing, they're learning from their peers and their ideas, and they're giving each other roles and responsibilities to achieve their goal. So sharing information then. So parents share what the, ch what the children build in their home, and we also share what the child creates in the classroom. So we do this through face-to-face -face interactions, maybe at home time, um, but during the day we would send um, an image of the creation and then uh, write down um, exactly how the child says it, uh, the description of what they built. So the parents know what they're after doing today in school, and now they can kind of carry on that learning at home or else do something different, it's, it's completely up to them. This allows parents and practitioners to work in a collaborative way and ensure that the learning taking place in the early year setting is reinforced and reflected at home. Parents and practitioners working together supports and contributes to the child's learning and development. So this is actually a picture of one of the children in my class. They made a train with three carriages and there was two people sitting in the second carriage. So I um, photographed this and I sent it to the parent with the description of what it was. And later on that day, I received this. 
So here is an example of what a child made in their home environment. So with me, they were building a train. And then here they made this incredible, um, it was actually meant to be um, a house that was in, in Spain. She was only back on from holidays um, after the summer holidays. And uh, she went to Spain and she was absolutely adored it. And this was her summer house in Spain. So with this creation, how we can extend the learning, you know, for parents. So it's giving them the tools of maybe what questions to ask. So the types of questions that you can ask is, tell me about your creation. What color blocks did you use? What shapes can you see? Did you have to change anything or face any obstacles or challenges? How many animals are there? What did you learn from building this? And again, that's the child is going to be using all that rich language, rich detail to explain all of their creation to us and to the parent. And it's great because the next day I get to show the child this photo and be like, wow, I heard that you built this. Do you want to tell me about it? And it's great, you know, and I have to say it has definitely improved the partnership that we have with parents. So I think the most important thing to say about First Lego League is that it is suitable for everyone, for every child, for every parent, for every practitioner. You know, First Lego League and introducing STEM language, it does not have to be an extra job or anything like that. It's just something that you can try and incorporate into your own daily routine. And I'm just going to finish up with this. Every child is a unique and different, and we all have different styles of learning, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult. We all have different styles of learning. Parents are all different and have their own style of parenting. Practitioners, even those with the same degree from the same college, are all different and have their own teaching style. So let's work together, learn from each other and accommodate each and every child's way of learning. Because at the end of the day, if everyone was the same, the world would be such a boring place. Thank you all so much. Oh, I think you're on mute, Jacinta. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natasha. I just, that last slide just did it for me. I think, you know, the fact that it's okay for us all to do things differently with the one common goal in mind. I think that, and it ties in with what Mary was saying um, so wonderfully. And I'm sure everyone will agree a fascinating and practical based presentation. I think we'll be seeing First Lego League in many more early learning centers after that. I just love that element of problem solving, which builds resilience. It's so important of the world of today. And I think, you know, it is a tool to build critical thinkers for the world we have. So that's just a brilliant. So now we have some queries which we uh, which have come in. So we'll check these out now. I just have to bring them over here. Sorry now. Just give me one second. Put on the specs. Um, okay, so we have a great question here from Denise Sheridan. So how do it's directed at uh, Mary? So how do we, as practitioners, Mary, challenge the expectations that parents have, not only of their children, but also of us educators? You know, how do we promote that message that our children are not trophies to be held up as a prize? And I, I you know. Yeah, this is this is a really interesting one, Denise. Can I just start by saying one thing, though? Natasha, I loved your presentation and I love your enthusiasm. I could actually hear you in the classroom when I was listening to you. And I love that yours was so practical. I think they complemented each other because I was being quite theoretical and you were so practical. And I felt bad about focusing on struggles for parents. I loved that you were focusing on their strengths. But sorry, Denise, your question. Oh, Denise, you know, this is it comes back to the pressure, though, doesn't it? That we're putting on we're putting on ourselves as parents we're putting ourselves as practitioners I think everybody is in the same boat at the moment that they're just feeling under pressure and these expectations are so high and I do know what you mean that I, you know I think because a lot of parents are feeling so stressed and maybe burnt out they are putting maybe more pressure on practitioners because maybe they nearly need your support more but they might not be asking for it in the right way so sometimes you can feel like they're you know frustrated and they're taking out your, their frustrations on you in in that sort of way and i keep coming back to maslow funny i'm saying to my students at the moment um 
try and step back and I'm saying to them try and you let your parents know but within your setting you're your staff talk to your staff talk to your parents talk to your kids about the fact that at the moment an awful lot of people are tired that they're I mean, I use the word burnt out because I'm hearing so many people say it to me, but actually have those conversations at the moment that we're, we're stepping back from things a little. And at the moment, our focus is on everybody's social and emotional well-being. It's on minding each other. It's on looking after each other. You know the way I'm always saying to parents, um, you know when children are anxious about COVID and I say, look, you can't promise them the world is always going to be a safe place. You can't promise them nothing will ever go wrong. But what can you promise them? You can promise them we are a little family and families take care of each other. That's what we do. And when things are hard, we look after each other. It's like sort of circling the wagons in and protecting each other. And I think, Denise, that's the message we need to be getting at the moment to our parents, our families, that everybody is struggling a little bit at the moment. So let's bring it back to basics. Let's just take a little bit of time, bring everything back to basics. Do you remember at the beginning of the well, beginning of the first lockdown? You're probably thinking, no, I don't want to remember that, Mary. But do you remember the first one? And it was a summer lockdown and we were all out in the garden. Remember banana bread? We were gardening, but the weather was lovely. And we all went back to basics at that time. And, it, you know, I know COVID was terrifying at the time, but yet there was something, um, oh, I think it was like a weight off people's shoulders. People weren't running to work. They weren't commuting. They were sitting in the back garden with their kids and paddling pools, and they were doing all this stuff with the kids that maybe they hadn't been doing. And I think, particularly after Christmas, I think we need to get that message back out there again back to basics and just look after being kind to each other and anything else and I know parents very often are they're thinking about education no not important let's think about our our emotional well-being at the moment if you have the emotional well-being everything else will come I think isn't that it yeah. um yeah. we have another question here from uh Sharon McCready and it's also for Mary. You're in the hot seat now, Mary. <laughs> um, what types of collaborative activities um, could early years practitioners engage with to support parents and caregivers to nurture that natural curiosity of children and extend opportunities for free play and learning in the home? Well, Sharon, I think Natasha can I just answer that nearly for you. And I know you you posted that. I see you posted that before Natasha started. Because as I was listening, you know, you know, when we think about um free play and you think very often about, you know, loose parts play and that sort of play. And that particularly with parents, I think very often they sometimes we play as I, we play with a game or we play with a, a you know a, a toy and to try and get parents to step back from that oh my gosh I think Natasha beautifully showed and even with the pictures of what the children had created that by stepping back from that idea we have to play with a toy you know the other thing as well Sharon when I when I read your message there and um, you I'm sure you've heard Pam of Pam Leo Pam Leo and um, oh she's a parenting expert if anyone hasn't heard of her she wrote um a book on parenting years ago. She's an American guru. Now, she's actually well retired at this point. She's a lovely lady. She actually it does a lot of, um, oh, she calls it up the book fairy now, and she does a lot of reading stuff with kids. But she was a woman who originally coined the whole love cup term, you know, about filling a child's love cup. That was Pam Leo. And what was one of her quotes was something about, um, oh, you'll spend the time with the child, whether you spend the child helping them or not. I can't remember the quote. Anyway, she's wonderful, wonderful. But one of her books originally was all about 10 minutes with your child and I say this to parents all the time when parents are saying to me about really connecting with their child but how do I connect and I keep going play free play I think but I don't know how to play and I say just follow the child's lead in your head get rid of that phone that, just get rid of the phone 10 minutes and try to have 10 minutes a day that Pam Leo used to always say it's not the quantity that matters it's the quality of the time with the child 10 minutes child-led completely whatever the child is doing no agenda remove your agenda follow their lead and something like the lego that natasha described oh my gosh that seems to be the perfect way you're the perfect tools to use particularly something that you're doing from the setting to the home i mean it, it's ideal but i but i always use that trick with parents i think 10 minutes a day 
you know, that's management. Well, 80-20 rule, I always say to them, if you get it right 80% of the time, you are doing brilliantly. You can't be perfect, like you're never going to get it right every day. But if you do right 80% of the time, you are doing really, really well. Aim for 10 minutes a day, just following their lead. So I hope that makes sense, Sharon. I think that absolutely does. And I love that element of the free play because, you know, even with the Lego there, I was so delighted to hear that it's so free with it because I actually hate it when they ended up putting instructions in the box. That's not what Lego was about for me. (laughs) So, you know, that kind of free play and following the child's lead, absolutely key. Um, I think we have a question from Connie now. So, uh, Mary, when you say connection, not perfection in terms of parenting, how would you see this translating into the workplace, you know, that relationship between parents, children and practitioners? Oh, Connie, I think this is about getting this message across. And again, if you think about that feeling of being burnt out at the moment. I mean, so many practitioners are telling me. I noticed one or two people put even in their comments that they're feeling a bit burnt out and they're thinking, how do I get the time to do all this stuff? And maybe it's about having those conversations. And if you think about connection, what's at the heart of connection? It's communication, isn't it? Actually having those conversations with them about letting go of perfection and going back to that whole idea of Maslow's of of really focusing on those lower level needs not worrying about what's up there let's bring it back down so sorry if it's kind of the same answer I've already given but I, I feel quite strongly about that I feel at the moment that's really what we need to be doing stepping back and and going back to basics and letting them know you know, at the moment, when COVID hit, and I, I was in Ireland AM, and I was giving talks about supporting anxious children, whatever, and I was getting a huge number of messages for parents. The number of parents who were sending me messages saying, I'm really failing, or I'm feeling I'm failing, or I'm a failure. And it was like, oh, my gosh. And I kept saying to parents, no, 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 you're not failing. This is really hard. At the moment, nobody is waltzing through life, you know, getting everything right and with everything going the way they thought it would be. Absolutely nobody is. At the moment, we're all just stepping back and going back to basics, going back to that, um, to relationships, to connection. So I'm, I'm not sure I can say other than communicate that to them. And you know, I think parents need to hear it. They really do. Oh, they absolutely do because there's such societal pressure. I totally agree when you said that. It really is there. And it is so, you can see people sagging under it, really. Um, We have another question here now from from Sinead. And um, she's saying, as an educator and play therapist, I love and respect play and all it gives to children. However, it is next to impossible to get the time, professional support, space, permission to try new things like outdoor classrooms or nature walks uh, rather than the norm. Um, further than the norm or other than the norm the expectations placed on educators nowadays is unrealistically high can we share responsibility with others Uh, and she also thanks you for trying to raise awareness of the importance of genuine connection and play as well Oh, Sinead I think that's a lovely probably a comment really more than a question and I think you're right we're just getting by at the moment And, and and again you know I think maybe to say that that's okay you know I think as educators I'm always saying to parents about putting themselves under this pressure you know, it's like this parenting bar is up here you can never really reach it so you're setting yourself up for failure and you're always fighting to get there oh my gosh I think educators do that too uh, particularly early ed if I'm very honest I think more so than at later levels and th- there's this need to achieve so much and we, and we like somebody mentioned Ash there earlier you know we we are embracing Asher and we're trying to work with it and we're looking at we've all these ideas and trying to do everything and that's wonderful but I think you're right at the moment I think Shane the expectations are huge and at the moment we are surviving we're getting through a pandemic and um, it's funny slightly off topic but I, I was listening to somebody saying today about the leaving cert they were talking about um 
potentially having a hybrid model for the Leaving Cert. And I was reading a report saying, um, it was in one of the teachers' unions that was saying, this is ridiculous. The schools are open at the moment. Why? Of course they can do the Leaving Cert. They should be out there doing the Leaving Cert. There's no need. And I thought, oh my gosh. I thought, you know, everybody, I've heard so many people say, I'm the expectations for me are too high. I'm not coping. I'm just surviving. I'm getting through. And I thought, Going to send our leaving certs out and say, you go and face if you're doing a leaving cert in the middle of it all. I think we all need to go easy on ourselves a bit and try and step back. Um, because I, I really feel at the moment people are burning out and we need it. It's like I'm saying you can't pour from an empty cup. It and you know, a bath doesn't cut it. You know, a bath with candles, yeah, that's all right for that hour. But if you're going back to face it the following day, um, but it is about trying to find some way for yourself to step back. And those conversations, as I was saying earlier, with parents, you know, even having that conversation with parents whether it's through your newsletter or I mean the circle time and all these things is wonderful I mean talk I mean you can communicate with parents in so many different ways but whatever way you're communicating to have these conversations about saying you know we're all under pressure you, know, you don't have to be the perfect parent at the moment and you know what I'm not the perfect educator at the moment I'm getting by and all I'm trying to focus is on your children's well-being that's what I'm focusing on because that's the most important thing at the moment and if we have this conversation together it nearly allows everybody to just breathe um, a little bit and I think we need that yeah it, it's actually giving educators and parents permission almost yes. to yeah yeah yep. yeah which almost is needed yeah yep. yeah absolutely um we've another question here from rosie um collaborative parenting and working as partners must be difficult when you have such a direct diverse range of families natasha how do you manage this particularly in terms of you know introducing that language of steam for families where english is not their first language mm -hmm. So I think the home visit really helps to lay that foundation to open that communication. So on the first day of school, you know, we already know each other. The partnership is only going to develop and grow stronger as that goes on. And, and I think it was from working in such a diverse school that I felt that maybe there was a need to visit parents like in more of a intimate and one-on-one -on -one setting that you could you know kind of delve deeper into that relationship especially if there was language barriers and things like this and I think um Rosie in relation to STEAM language nobody said it had to be through English why not encourage them to do it through their home language you know and yes, if they want to do it through English, I will provide them any supports, any language that they need. I can write it phonetically for them. But I think it's really important that as practitioners, we also nurture their home language. And if they want to do this through their home language, we let that go. And you know what? They can write it phonetically for me and I can try to do it in the setting. Um, and I think that's kind of... Now, it did take me take me a while to realize this, but I think that that is the most important thing is to nurture their values and their beliefs and their routines. You know, and many of my families in the setting, they their kind of rule is that they speak their whole language at home. And then once they step outside that front door, they all try their best to communicate in English. And we have to remember, they have to go and talk to grannies who maybe don't understand English. So what I kind of did this year was I said to them, there was no pressure to introduce this language through English, not at all introduce it to your home language and we can work together on that so yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's true partnership there isn't it it's 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 just that accepting of everybody's values and oh it's wonderful absolutely um Another question for Natasha, you're in the hot seat now. It's from Siobhan. <laughs> Mary's getting a rest. Um, how do you get the parents to understand that these years in preschool are just as important as the primary school, that it isn't just playing? And I think that's a really important question there now. I think that's so important. And to be honest, I was guilty of my first year teaching. I was like, they need to know sounds numbers like colors and I was freaking out of this checklist and then I said well hold on if I'm freaking out what are the parents thinking and if they're thinking oh my goodness like Natasha needs them to know all this like I need to work harder 
I suppose that's when I kind of stripped it back and said, well, they can learn their numbers in a different way. So, you know, it's about all about like kind of encouraging parents that, yes, it is playing. However, explaining all of the learning opportunities that come with that. So whether it's a child building, you know, something with Play-Doh and you're asking them about the texture or you're asking them, you know, how many, you know, balls did you make or you know what was the color of your play-doh that that is actually extending their learning and I think that's the most important thing is to communicate that with parents that you know even show them what the primary school curriculum is and say like all of that will come you know there is no rush in it let them play let them be curious because actually play is going to let them develop more lifelong learning than learning numbers or something at a table so I think it's really important that we express that to parents and um, that, you know, all the things that come with playing so that their view isn't like, oh, well, they're in that setting for three hours and all they're doing is playing with with dolls, you know. So maybe just taking a different approach and explaining all the learning that is coming from playing with a doll. You know, if if a woman or a boy is playing with a doll, that just means that they might be great parents or a great uncle or a great, you know, auntie and stuff. So they're learning how to be that, you know, kind of nurturing soul. And that's just as for, as important. And again, I think it's really important. Uh, even someone said about Asher, you know, even showing them the Asher document, telling them about the primary school curriculum and tell them that all that learning will come. And there is no point in rushing childhood. Yeah, it really gives them a knowledge and understanding of their world. And I do believe that the play that they do in the early years breeds that positive learning dispositions for all future learning. It will be built on it. So absolutely, Natasha, you're right. Um, I so agree with you. And we have another question here from Kelly coming in. Um, Natasha, again, the Lego venture sounds very interesting, but what has been the parental response uh, to engaging with the program? Are they excited to be involved with you or do they kind of shy away a little bit from the engagement? Um, about 90% of our parents welcomed this new, you know, experience for their child and for themselves and for us with open arms. And I think it was like the 90% was so high was because they had got such an insight into what we do. And I suppose during lockdown, they kind of maybe started to value play a bit more and um, from what we were sharing. And, you know, they were understanding that they were learning so much from playing at home, you know. Um, but I have to say 10% did shy away from it. And um, I just kind of had to approach them in a very, you know, nice and non-intrusive manner and just ask, you know, kind of why, why was that? And, you know, and is there anything that I could do to, you know, maybe explain it further to you? Was there anything that I could do to help support you, you know, in doing this? And, you know, one parent said to me, I just don't have the time. I feel like it's an extra chore. I I just can't, like I'm at like breaking edge and and I just can't do it. And, I just said, okay. I said, so can I ask you a question? She was a bit like, oh God. (laughs) And I said, look, I said, if your child runs up to you and they've made something with Lego, do you say, wow, like, what did you build? And they were like, well, yeah, of course. And I said, well, I said, that's, you know, introducing, you know, language of steam. Because I said, you've just after letting them expand their language by opening that question to them. Um, and it did take maybe a couple of conversations to really get them on board. Um, and also, I think they originally thought, the 10% originally thought that it was kind of like a sole parent thing. So, you know, um, maybe the stay-at-home dad or the stay-at-home mom, they were a bit like, oh, God, like, am I going to have to do this all by myself? And I was like, definitely not. I said, get the whole family involved. I said, siblings. I said, invite the cousins over if you want. I said, it is for everybody. And I said, the more, the merrier. You know, see what your child at eight is building with six bricks and see what your child at three is building. You know, I said, give it to your two-year-old if you want and see what they create. I said, because any creation that they make it's going to be incredible. It's like when they paint, paint some uh, a brown blob on a piece of paper in school. And she's like, oh, you know, tell me about your painting. And they're like, it's a volcano erupting and it's gone the whole way down to here, there and everywhere. And you're like, wow, well, I didn't expect that one, but I love it, <laughs> you know? Um, but I have to say 90% were really open and 10% did shy away from it. And I think it was just through all the interaction, 
uh, with them and kind of explain it from what it was, explaining that it wasn't going to be an extra chore and explaining that it was something that they could incorporate into their everyday routine. And again, like Mary was saying, 10 minutes is all you need and implement that 80-20 rule and you're flying, do you know? But it, it did, for 10%, it did take, you know, a lot of interaction and a lot of explaining and, you know, obviously not, you know, telling them that they have to do it either, you know, it was completely optional, this this um, whole project. Well, I have to say, uh, Natasha, I think you would be, as a parent, I think you would be, what would you say? You would be on board just listening to your enthusiasm. Yeah. It would be very hard not to be brought along with all of that. Oh, um, I think I, you're too enthusiastic. A question from Andrea and one I myself years ago in the classroom when I had children, my own children in the classroom with me, um, would have absolutely loved to know the answer to at that time. So um, I think it's a a very good question uh, here from Andrea. So uh, she'd like to thank you, Dr. Mary, as always, for so much valuable information. And as a parent, uh, she feels that she needs to let her children be mm-hmm. independent, learn yeah. things by himself, etc. As an early years educator, I do encourage children to solve problems themselves, to be independent, to give them the tools to deal with any unpleasant situations, etc. But how do you bring that home with you? You know, how do you transition it between oh, one and the other? Andrea, this is making me laugh. Andrea, I was talking on Ireland AM one morning about how important it is to step back from the child and allow your child this freedom, allow them to be independent. And I was having this big conversation. And my husband used to work where he would be working in people's houses. And this particular morning, he happened to be working in this lady's house and he made fatal schoolboy error. He turned around to the lady and he went, oh, that's my wife on TV. So the lady said, oh, well, you better watch her. And he didn't have the nerve to say, sorry, I don't want to watch her. I have to put up with her every day at home. So he had to sit and watch me on TV. I was talking about how important to stand back from the child. Don't interfere, whatever. Well, he came home and he said to me, Mary, you are the world's worst for jumping in. And I am. I I'm not, haven't figured this one out myself. I think, isn't it funny when you have your professional hat on, you know you should do something. And then when you have that emotional connection with your own child, I know you, they come to you upset about something and you think don't solve the problems for them. And I have to hold myself back. So I struggle with that one too. But I think it's just something we need to keep working and reminding yourself, no literally step back from the child let that little bit of professional thinking take over but do you think sometimes it's because we're so rushed in our working life you're that's your job so you are there you you well now people are saying we have very little time but you know as an educator that time is dedicated to those children but when you go home and your youngest is trying to do something and you're thinking but I have to get to dinner and I have to do this and I have to do that and I'm rushing oh, I have to collect the others at nine from football so you do it for them because you do it quicker and you do it faster and you do it probably properly and you think it'll take them more time so I think that's part of it we're more rushed at home so maybe it's again thinking about stepping back and making the time to allow them to make mistakes. I mean, we were talking earlier about, Natasha was talking about the mistakes and everything with Lego and getting it wrong. Oh my gosh, I mean, mistakes are so important in terms of learning experiences for our children. And if we jump in all the time, we're not giving them those opportunities. So I suppose it's about reminding ourselves to to step back, I mean, step back from the child. Absolutely. And and we don't have to be perfect and we don't have to solve it all all the time. No. But sometimes that kicks in um, and comes in over your early years educator hat yep. Yep. <laughs> as Definitely. a parent. But um, Andrea just has another little query there and it's yes. aimed at Natasha. How do we engage children who don't like Lego or haven't taken to Lego in the classroom? This is a really interesting comment because in my own session, I would say about five out of 19 actually played with the Lego. Um, And I was a little bit apprehensive about the first workshop. I was like, what's going to happen if nobody wants to play with it? 
And you know what? Because it was something new in the setting, it was something they hadn't really seen before. You know, we're used to the smaller Lego. This was more like the Duplo Lego, so a bit bigger. And, um, you know, in my Duplo Lego, it's only that, you know, I didn't have the cool wheels. I didn't have a cool, there was a thing to make a seesaw, which I actually loved. Um, and it moved up and down and it was squidgy and it was bouncy. And I suppose it was something new for the children and it, it did draw on, on their interest it was colorful you know there was flowers and like the girls could not believe that there was flowers in it the boys couldn't believe that there was a football in it like I mean it was kicked across the table I'd say 10 times <laughs> but it was great because we said like you know why why is it rolling you know what shape it is and we just turned it all into a learning experience as well um but I have to say there was some who, who took to it a lot quicker and there was others who needed a little bit more time. And that's absolutely fine. If they want to go and explore with something else, they are more than welcome to. But again, because there's so much more than just Lego, and it was about, you know, building stuff and working in pairs. And it was kind of the first time we had ever sat down with four children um, in pairs and said, you know, OK, what is transport? Now, build me your idea of transportation. And I think it was because there was a little bit of, of unknown and the curious beings came out of the children and they really wanted to now explore and discover what this new thing was. Um, so for me personally in the classroom, they all kind of had a grow from it. Some more than others, obviously, and um, that's only natural. But all I can say is maybe you know, observe what their interests are. So if they like to, you know, play with dinosaurs, maybe incorporate Lego into that and say like, wow, will we build something for the dinosaur? Or why don't we try and build a dinosaur with the Lego? Um, and just link it to what they're already interested in and see then if that helps their, you know, interests go more towards the Lego, um, you know, so kind of incorporate Lego, but also their interests and see if that, if that combination will help them, them to come with it. Because I do know with the smaller Lego, Lego oftentimes they, they can sometimes give up if the piece won't go straight in. And again, that's a learning moment for them because they have to work on, you know, that challenge and that obstacle. And we can show them in different ways that they can put it together. So sometimes it's just about observing the child, seeing what their interests are or else seeing, you know, what way can we support them to maybe feel more confident in using Lego as well. And um, also the fact that they were bringing it home, they liked the crossover. So they're really excited to get in and show me what they made last night. Um, and I think that kind of helped as well. Because again, you know, if a parent is really interested in it, or even on the first day of school, if the parent feels confident, the child will feel more confident. So if the parent is really enjoying the Lego at home, I feel like the child will carry that then into the school setting. So I think having maybe two environments that are, you know, really engaging um, with it can, can help maybe them to interact with it a little bit more. And also, I, I would have found over the years that a child to learn from something doesn't actually have to be engaged in it or using it, because I'm sure you've had the experience where, you know, somebody has made something and they're chatting about it. And the next thing, the guy that you absolutely taught was not interested in Lego whatsoever, is hanging over the table, giving his yeah. tuppence worth on it, you know, and yeah. discussing it and getting involved in the in the conversation around it. So there's still learning uh, to be had around it, even if they're not using it as such. Um, yeah. Mary, you're back up in the hot seat now. This is a question for you from Maeve. Uh, what is your advice to early years practitioners when reassuring parents that they will care for their children as much as the parent themselves care for them? You know, it's that kind yeah. of heart-wrenching transition and, and how do you reassure? Yeah, and funny Maeve, I always, I love Jules Page and the professional love idea. Um, and I know when Noreen was talking at her presentation, which I watched back and she was talking about the importance of care in early childhood care and education and I absolutely am in total agreement with her on that it's just it's such an important part of our role and um, you know I remember oh my gosh and I'm not even sure exactly when it crept in but do you remember if you're a little bit back in the day like me there came a point where they said now practitioners shouldn't be hugging children you shouldn't have a ch and thinking no 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 hold on the minute here you're trying to remove all 
affection with that child and and nurturing this role is about nurturing them and it's so so important so again I think I think it's when the parent knows that that's how you feel. Now, funny because I, my PhD was about transition. In fact, Noreen was my supervisor on my PhD years ago, back in the day. But uh, and so I would have done a lot of things about transitional activities and stuff like that. And I know we've had. I'm part of a, a trans, ESERA special interest group for transitions, and in terms of that handover and that um that the trust building COVID has damaged so many of those activities it, it's it's been harder to be, develop relationships when you're you can't be within six foot of a person they can't come into a setting it's all these different these pods there's, there's so many um factors that have impacted on building those relationships and made it harder but I think part of it is that understanding that you really care as you say that you care for them and that they absolutely know that I think you can be kind of clever about transitional activities as well and I mean Natasha was talking about online earlier and I know it's not the same as having parents in your setting but you can be inventive about what you do and uh, funny little tips I just put them up the other day on Facebook after Christmas because I was aware um people were saying to me their children were nervous about going back to school because COVID seemed to have exploded over Christmas and I suppose you know much as we trying to protect our children sure they're hearing about numbers and they're hearing about cases and whatever so parents are saying oh my gosh my my child is really nervous and I put up a post about something that I normally always put up in September and it's silly little little tiny transitional objects a little love heart um drawn on your wrist and another one on the child's wrist and um, if you're if you're on Facebook and if you look at my Facebook pebble in your pocket and worries in my pocket all these little ideas but even as a practitioner if you're interacting with parents in that way and letting them know we're thinking about this, we're thinking about connection, we're, you know, that's our goal, that's our focus. Just telling that to parents. You know, I couldn't believe I put up that post the other day and it's thousands of shares of people are all about it. And that's just because that conversation was started at a time when, in, in a way, I didn't even realize it was an important conversation. If we open these conversations with parents, suddenly I was shocked at the feedback it got that when you start the conversation, I think the parents will come back to you. You, know, They really will engage. I do agree, Mary. It's so much about the connection and care of parents as well as of children. You know, I, I really do believe we care for both. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it is really difficult for, for people to drop off their children and they haven't had that, you know, maybe home visit yeah. or whatever that is yeah. normally offered at this point in time. Um, another question from Colette there. Um, this question is for Mary. What advice would you have for practitioners on how to reach those hard to reach parents? And in fact, if some pe parents don't want to be involved, should we label them as hard to reach parents? Oh, I love this, Colette. But one of the pictures, I didn't have time to go through it. And um, in the present day, I was really aware I was eating into Natasha's time. But I had a picture of, of two little girls um, on my slide. And I, I have that picture because it always reminds me of a story, which I'll really, really quickly tell you. And it was, I was working in a setting. I'd finished the PhD and myself and Noreen were actually working together um, on another transitions project after that. Um, and it was in quite a disadvantaged area. And I was working with 12 different preschools and one of these preschools were telling me about this family okay and they were talking about this family we were talking about the mum and the 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 little girl was a in the preschool class okay so she was coming in but her, her mum would push her in in a buggy with a little sister and the, so it was a double buggy the two of them would come in so the child would come in in the buggy every morning with a bag of crisps and a can of coke and it drove the practitioners round the bend because they were saying she's bouncing off the walls when she comes in and, uh, and we've tried to ask her not to do this but and I was saying to them um, it, it came up in conversation as we were talking about other things and I was saying to them uh, do you think that maybe that's the best she can do that when she wakes up in that morning that she knows 
it's important to get that little girl to you and she feels this is the best thing for her little girl like she's gotten up out of bed she's gotten the two of them in the buggy maybe all she's been able to do is give her a can of coke and crisps but there's something in her head making her get that child to you like she's trusting you with her baby and she was what they would call a hard to reach parent and they ended up really connecting with her and just sitting and having conversations with her and it I won't go into the details of it and um, just to respect their privacy but the relationship changed when they actually stopped and talked to her about come in and let's chat come in how are you doing and how are you getting on and we're so pleased to see her and tell us how you're getting on it shifted that relationship completely because the little girl they used to call her crisps and coke girl and um, it, it changed everything with that dynamic now th that family was what they would call a hard to reach family but it's trust isn't it it's connection and it's funny and i know what you mean shouldn't i be able to be I don't want to connect with you, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and yes, every parent has the right to do that. But there's a part of the mummy and me, there's a bit in me feeling, you know, if we go back to the Russian dolls and we go back to our pumpkin, we the child is not a child alone. You, we can't view that child in isolation. And it is important that we bond with that family. And, and even though they might be giving us the impression, I do not want to get involved, surely we are there as a tool to support them in whatever way we can and if we get that message over and we if we get that message across and they really feel no thank you i don't need any support that's fine but it's about making sure they get that message that i'm there for you and it goes back to that whole professional love thing and just as jacinta said that's not only about the child it is about the the extended family you know it's about them all it's not only a child coming into you, you're taking on board a family for, for better or worse and with every child who comes into the setting. So I would always encourage you to try and go that extra mile to meet them. But if they if they feel, no, I'm really self-sufficient, obviously that's their right. But you'd like them to know if I can be here for you. And I always think of that family and that mum with that little girl because it did make a difference when the mum realised they weren't judging her and they were saying if we can do anything to help we're here for you as well as her it, it shifted her, that mum's thinking you know that it, it you know partnership you know that's really what it is and that's what we want so i hope totally. that makes sense Claire. yeah oh totally mary it really does and i i think you know that parent as long as parents know that we are there if um they want to but i think for us to understand that parents come to us with all their life experiences and mm -hmm. that that has impacted them so sometimes it's about understanding and you know yeah. as, as you say not judging um but anyway guys that's all we have time for <laughs> so um i really believe that i speak for all here uh, that we have been given a lot of food for thought tonight uh, from both Mary and Natasha, which will provide us all with reflection points regarding relationships with parents and how they can be viewed from many and various angles, which will certainly be valuable to our practice. Thank you both so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us. It was an honor to host you both. Um, to all the attendees, thank you so much for contributing and for inputting with your comments and queries. That just that last discussion was just fantastic. Um, there will, of course, be more expert-led webinars in the coming months. So keep an eye on the Portobello Institute website and also on the social media pages. That's hard to say, social media pages. <laughs> and all that's left for me now to say is enjoy the remainder of your evening. Uh, stay safe and mind yourselves, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Jacinta. Bye, Natasha. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, yeah. Natasha. Thank you.